Welcome. Good evening. All right, quiet down. Thank you. Well, my name is Brian Kniff. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm here tonight to welcome you to our symposium on sustainability. I have to make just a very brief couple of remarks. And one is to say that this is the kind of thing we do. Uh, as a Jesuit university, it's very important to us to address the most critical problems of the larger human community. And I think everyone here knows tonight that issues of sustainability, energy, climate change are you know, at the top of anyone's list of the issues that need to be addressed for the betterment of the world. Secondly, I'm very excited to be here. And you know, there's a lot of events I go to where I'm supposed to say that, but tonight I really mean it. Because we have some wonderful faculty here tonight including Senator Blake, who is one of our adjunct faculty, is very generous with his time and his wisdom and his expertise for our university. And when it comes to issues like sustainability, I think one of the most important things we all need to realize, and for students in the audience, I think this is an important lesson in this, is that these kinds of issues do not fit into academic departments. That to deal with them effectively and to really make a difference we need to bring to bear the expertise from a whole wide range of disciplines and research methods and approaches. And that's what you're gonna see here tonight. I'm very proud that we have faculty who do this, not just their work in their fields, in, this, in their own field in sustainability, but who come together in this kind of way. And I'm excited to be listening to them. So, Without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Professor Nick Truncale, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Can everyone hear me on my microphone? Uh, before we get to the panel, uh, I wanted to give everyone an introduction into exactly what sustainability means to a specific project that we've been working on in the physics department for the past year and a half. All right, so the title of the presentation is Sustainability in Practice. Um, I don't know if most of you know what sustainability is. There's a nice little definition in your little pamphlet that you got today. Uh, but I wanted to talk about maybe the origins of where this term sustainability came from. Back in the 80s, there were many countries that were going to be emerging and, uh, technology and using technology to develop their country. And they became aware of what their impacts would be on the world at large. Uh, so as a part of this, the UN Secretary General during that time period uh, created a commission called the Brundtland Commission. And out of that commission, many things came about. But one thing that came from that commission was a definition of sustainable development. And here it is. It says that sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this was in 1987. And pretty much the definition today hasn't really changed. So it's being able to sustain our current lifestyles and also to sustain lifestyles that may be happening in the future. So what I'm hoping you get out of my presentation and then after the panel discussion is what does sustainability really mean to you? What could you do to help the planet become more sustainable? So I'm hoping that's what you can get out of tonight. So my project that I'm working on with Jim Love, and he's one of the, the panelists that you'll hear about tonight, it's a solar energy project. So what I wanted to first talk about were just some energy basics so everyone's on the same page. So here's the first question I'm going to ask. How much energy does a 100 watt light bulb consume in 10 hours? Well, the first thing you're going to have to know is what does 100 watts mean? This is called the power rating of your light bulb. It tells you how much energy is being consumed per unit time. Okay? So who pays an electric bill in here? Probably not many of the students, but I know a lot of the, the adults that are real adults. Uh, they pay an electric bill. And you're paying for what? You're paying for a kilowatt hour. So how do I get? Watts into kilowatts. Well, that's easy. That's just a metric conversion. So 100 watts is 0.1 kilowatt. Then to get your energy, you just multiply that kilowatt power rating times how many hours your appliance is on. So that 100 watt light bulb after 10 hours will consume one kilowatt hour of energy. So here's my second question. If you have a 200 watt solar panel, how much energy is output from that panel after 13 hours? Is the answer 
The power rating in kilowatts, 0.2 kilowatts, times 13 hours. Now, if that were true, we would look at a plot, of a, uh, a plot that looks like power versus time. That's what we look at when we do a project like this. And it looks something like this. You have power on the vertical axis and then time on the horizontal. So if it was true, you get 0.2 kilowatts output from your panel throughout the entire day. All you would have is a straight line across on the top of that panel where it reads 0.2 kilowatts. Now the energy associated with that power is called the area underneath that curve. So you see that's a rectangle. So you would just do 0.2 kilowatt hours times 13 hours. You'd get 2.6 total kilowatt hours of energy. Now is this actually how a solar panel works? No, that's not how it works, right? How does it work? Well, the sun rises in the east, it goes across the horizon, and then eventually, eventually sets in the west. So if you're actually looking at how much energy you get from a conventional solar panel setup of 200 watts, you'd really only get one kilowatt hour of energy from that device. So if you compare that to the ideal situation, you'd get, you, should, you should be getting 2.6 kilowatt hours because the panels that we use in our device, they're great panels. They are fully capable of outputting 2.6 kilowatt hours, but that's not what we get. We only get one. I liken this as if you were to go buy a car, okay, and they gave you a 30 mile per gallon rating for your vehicle. Well, what would you do if you went home and then you found out that your car only got 12 miles per gallon? You'd probably do one of two things. You'd either take it back and get your money back, right? I, I would think that most of you would be what you do. Or you would think about, are you doing something to not get that rating? Are you doing something incorrect? So maybe what we're doing with our conventional setups, and I'll talk about how we set up a solar panel conventionally, maybe we're doing something wrong. Maybe we can do something more to get a number closer to this ideal output. So the question is, is it possible to create a device where the energy output is greater than that conventional? And we set a goal originally for the project. Can we get something that's double the amount of energy? Okay. So. Why even do this? Why would we want to create a device to use existing solar panels to give us more energy? Well, I don't know how many people know, but how much energy is consumed by the United States in one year? It's quite a big number. It's four trillion, that's 12 zeros there if I'm counting correctly, four trillion kilowatt hours of electrical energy. If you look at the population of the people living in the United States, you're each, each one of you in this room is responsible for about 30 kilowatt hours per person per day, all right? That's a lot of energy. So one question our collaboration, all the people in our project were trying to answer is, what can we do to increase the amount of energy produced but still be sustainable? So I'll try to answer that question through my presentation. Secondly, the human condition depends on energy as much as anything else. Think about how you got here today. If you were on campus, you're a student, you probably walked here, but you probably had to cook dinner somewhere. If you didn't cook it yourself, you were down in the cafeteria. Somebody had to use energy to create that food. If you drove here, you're using energy to get here in your vehicle. We're in an air-controlled room, so it's at this one temperature. Some energy has to come from that, all of these lights. So we use energy on a daily basis, and you almost don't even think about it. All right. So can we improve that human condition? Now, our human condition here in the United States, I would say, is really nice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some other human condition that maybe you're not fully aware of, and maybe you don't think about on a daily basis, and what can this device that I'm gonna talk about help? How is it gonna help those people? Now you saw the title of my presentation was Sustainability in Practice. Jim and I, we think about this a little differently. We think about it as practical sustainability. All right, I could have sat there and modeled all of this device out you know, on a computer and see if it was gonna really work, but we, what we decided to do, we just decided to make the thing and see if it worked, right? So here it is. Uh, this is the reflective solar tracker. I'll talk about it in a minute, but this isn't just a University of Scranton project. It's involving two other institutions. One is Pennsylvania State University out at main campus, and then also the Sustainable Energy Fund out of Allentown. And we have actually the president of the Sustainable Energy Fund with us here tonight. Uh, they were kind enough to give us a, a grant along with uh, money from our uh, College of Arts and Sciences Dean's Office to pursue a commercialization of this device. Okay? So let's just talk about it for a second. When you look at this device, you see these big shiny things on either side. These are reflectors. They reflect additional light onto your panel. So it's like you're just doubling the amount of uh, light energy that are actually, it's actually, that's actually impacting your solar cell. And what you can't see, and what I'll, I'll point out in another diagram, 
is this also rotates, so it's always constantly facing the sun. All right. So this is our solar side here on the tennis court uh, over uh, the parking lot by our tennis court. And that's five parking spaces. That's a thousand bucks worth of real estate right there that we, that we got from Dean Kniff. So that was cool. Here's our site out at main campus. They have the same setup. They have a conventional version. And I like this picture better. So what does conventional mean? Like, how do we set up solar panels now? Well, what we do is that we have the panels facing the southerly direction if we're in the northern hemisphere. And we angle them at the latitude for your location. That's the conventional way of doing things. And they're stationary. They don't move. There's no reflection. They just sit there. But ours, what it does, it rotates and reflects. All right? So how does reflection and tracking affect your power output and then really your total energy output of your solar panel? All right? Well, here's the actual data. This is from June 5th of this summer. This is where I modeled the conventional uh, output. All right, so on this day, we got one kilowatt hour of energy. Now, what's important when you're looking at these plots? It's important that the area under the curve be bigger than what you're seeing here. So the bigger area you see when I put the RST behind this one, that means more energy. So here's the RST output. All right? It's more significant. In fact, it's 2.4 kilowatt hours. So when you look at the percent difference, you're looking at an additional 140% more energy. So this is nearly two and a half times the energy from an existing conventional solar setup. Okay. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted to break this picture down a little bit better. Because um, it looks like, look at the morning. These are the morning hours. It looks like our percentage increase is way more than the conventional. And then in the midday, yeah, we're still getting a bigger boost, but it's not as significant as in the morning. And then the afternoon is kind of just mirroring the morning. So what I did was I broke down this plot hour by hour to see how much energy I would get for every hour period throughout the day. And this is what we get. Now, what can I take away from this bar chart? I'm sure you're all sick of looking at this kind of stuff right all day. But this is what I see when I see this plot. The red, remember, is the conventional. They're getting what I'm calling a three-hour solar day. This means that for only three hours, you're getting maximum output from your panels. Well, look at the RST. You're almost getting an eight to 10-hour solar day. Um, I just put in circle this bar and this bar, but this bar and this bar are beating the conventional. All right, so you're increasing your, the length of your solar day, and I'll talk about why that's important in a second. So really just to finish my presentation, how can the RST increase energy production but still be sustainable? All right, so this is that first question I asked when I was talking about the rationale for the device. So what's the RST's future? Well, we're thinking we can have solar electric generation facilities. They have these now for conventional panels, but instead of just stationary ones, we'll just have RSTs. We'll have things that reflect and rotate. Now, why is that going to be a good thing? Well, it's going to help during peak demand. Think about when you use all your energy. You wake up in the morning, you take a hot shower, probably way too long than I do, right? But you're in the shower for 45 minutes, you have to heat that water, you have to cook yourself breakfast. So you have the hours between 8 to 10 in the morning. What happens after work or after school? You go home, you cook your dinner, you heat your house up because it's cold. All right. So our increased solar day will help with that increased demand on the electrical grid if we have these solar electric generation facilities. Standalone safety lighting infrastructure. You can take two of these RSTs, uh, put them on the side of a road, and they could light up eight lampposts with low power LED light bulbs. All right. We also have mobile 100 watt versions of the RST. If you saw walking in the room, you saw that weird looking device out there with shiny panels. That's our mobile version. What can we do with those? Well, these have a variety of uses. We've had so many people come up to us and ask us, hey, can I put one of these in our backyard? Yeah, sure. Why not? Put them on a the lamppost, hook it up to the electrical grid, and you're good. You're being green. You're sending energy back onto the system. Farmers. What do farmers have? They have fences. Tons of fence posts. You can slap one of these on each fence post, and then you have a big grid of these RSTs. This can be used for emergency or rapid response situations. I know what happens when a hurricane comes through or a tornado. What happens? You run out of electricity. The power, the grid goes down. So you can have these things ready to go, pending that there's actually sunlight out there. Bring them out, and you can have power on, on an emergency site. And then the last, last thing, one of the uh, students who worked with us last spring uh, is going to be uh, building a, like a new food truck. You know how they have these food vans that drive around and sell people food? Well, he was interested. Can I put one of these on top of my van so when I'm parked you know, on Spruce Street downtown or somewhere in Dixon City? You know, I could throw the RST up there, and it could collect energy and maybe run my radio or the lights inside of my car or my food van. All right. And the last thing, and this is not the least of all, 
to educate people about sustainability. You wouldn't believe how many people that I talked to who were younger who I say, you know, do you know what sustainability is? And they really don't have a clue. All right, so I had the opportunity to go to a conference this summer uh, at Villanova University sponsored by the SEF. And it was really nice. I gave a similar presentation to this. And uh, there was a middle school and a high school science fair. So I probably had, I don't know, 50 to 60 students there uh, seeing me do a project. And they were doing you know, a science fair project. And that's kind of what this is to us. This is just a fun project me and Jim started to do. And uh, we're just going with it and it's being a really good thing. And those kids who saw us do that at that conference, I think it gave them a little bit of uh, you know, gumption to go forward and continue their education in the science. Now the last question, how can technologies like the RSC improve human condition? I'm going to show you a few pictures here. You probably recognize some of them. Uh, this is a picture of the United States taken by a NASA, an imager, so a, a vehicle in space. Um, it's obviously a map of the United States. We have, here's Chicago, there's Atlanta, this is the I-95 corridor, Long Island. Now if you can see, there's a little strip right here. That little strip right there is the Lackawanna and Luzerne Valley. All right, so that's lit up just like everywhere else in the United States is lit up. So we have a pretty good human condition. Same in Europe. This is a picture of uh, Western Europe. Here's London, Paris, the Netherlands. They have a pretty good electrical system in place where they have a lot of energy. Here's one more picture. This is Africa. Africa, by the way, is three times the size of the United States. And all they have, this is the capital of South Africa in Johannesburg and this is the Nile River, and this is the Nile Delta up near the Mediterranean. Pretty much everywhere else in Africa, they don't have anything. They don't have lights. They have no electrical grid, no infrastructure. All right? I'm just going to talk about one place uh, where that yellow star is. Uh, it's a little north of Lake Victoria right here, and then this is Lake Turkana. This is called the Nile, uh, River, uh, Rift, the Nile Rift Valley. I'm just going to show you what the human condition like is in this place. Uh, this is the Kakuma refugee camp located in northwest Kenya. Um, and you can basically see if you're not living in a hut with this metal roof, you're basically just living in a tent. Um, just to give you an idea about the size of this particular camp, uh, the land area is four and a half square miles. That's one-fifth the size of the city of Scranton. And its population is 125,000 people. That's 50,000 more than the population of Scranton. So you're cramming all these people in this really small space, and they pretty much don't have an infrastructure for anything, basically. Basically, when they do take satellite images of Africa, what they see are fires. That's really all they can see. Now, I want to show you this plot here. This was from September 19th of uh, last month. We have since went to full power with our RSD, so we have four 100-watt panels, so our maximum is 400 watts. And on a really good, nice day, we're getting six kilowatt hours. So what I want to talk to you about is what can a refugee camp do with six kilowatt hours of energy? And just to remind you there, each one of you is responsible for 30 kilowatt hours of energy per person per day. And all the things I'm going to talk about here, you can do with just one RST, just one. You can power a well, powder, a well uh, a water pump for three hours, which will pump 2,000 liters of water. And that's enough for about 100 people. We can add some light to their uh, darkness. Uh, we can illuminate five schoolhouses, five medical clinics, or nighttime area lighting with these low power LED lights for about five hours a day. Now, why is that important? It's, well, they don't go to school during the day. Why don't they go to school during the day in the middle of the desert? It's too hot, right? So they wait till the night. And what do you need at night in a room with no windows? You need light, all right? And on top of that, you can have a charging station to charge 30 cell phones for three hours, or 15 laptops for three hours. So this is all, in totality, just from one RST, just for six kilowatt hours of energy. I want to go back to this picture. This is Africa again with the Kakuma refugee camp reference. I did some research into how many of these refugee camps exist, and uh, what you're seeing pop up. I just chose uh, 40 random refugee camps from Africa. All right, these are people that you know, don't have an infrastructure. And if we can give them light, if we can send their kids to school at night, if we can give them some sense of security, because why do you put a porch light on at night? You do that to protect your house. Well, they don't have porch lights. All right. 
If you add up the population of all of these refugee camps, that's four million displaced or stateless people that are living in Africa. All right, so why do this? Why adopt sustainable practice? Well, our lives are very good. But how long can those lives be sustained? I'm hoping we can talk a little bit about that during our panel discussion. Now, sustainability and social justice are linked. I almost didn't want to even put social justice up there only because I don't consider myself an expert. But I think you all know what it means, right? It was funny. I was, I'm missing my son's uh, first basketball practice tonight to do this presentation. So he was curious as to why I was going to miss it. So I was telling him this weekend what I'd be talking about. I was telling him, you know, we're going to take sunlight, convert that to electricity so he can run his Xbox or whatever. You know, he was happy about that. But then I also wanted to talk to him about, you know, we're also trying to talk to people, you know, and try to convince them to help people that need help the most. Right? And he's like, oh, Daddy, can I come? I help people all the time. I can talk, too. He was real excited. He wanted to be here. Right? I mean, an eight-year-old kid knows right, to help people. I mean, it, it's obvious, isn't it? You want to be there and help people who cannot help themselves. I have one quote. I usually don't, don't like doing quotes in presentations, but I thought this was a good one and it applied because we're at the University of Scranton. Somebody this past summer said, the measure of a greatness of a society is found in the way it treats those the, the most in need, those who have nothing apart from their poverty. Does anyone in here know who said that? You can just yell it out if you do. Anyone know? That was Pope Francis. He said that while he was visiting a shanty town in Brazil. So the highest ranking Jesuit in the Catholic Church said that. But that's obvious, right? I mean, it never once occurred to Jim and I when we started this project that we weren't going to send this technology over to Africa to help these people. It was never a question of doing it. It was just a matter of when we would do it. And that's really what we're working on now. Because after all, if you have the power and the means and the influence to help people who have next to nothing, isn't our responsibility to do that? So that's what we're going to do. So I'm hoping after our presentation today, you have some idea about what you can do to help others who are most in need. So that concludes my presentation. At this time, I'm going to ask the panelists to uh, go up to the stage. And I'm going to continue as moderator, so I'll just be sitting here. If you have a question for one of our panelists, or just a question in general, the pamphlet that you have, there's a slip of paper. And you can write something on that paper and then hand it to one of the gentlemen that are in the back and they'll bring it up to me. Otherwise, I'll just be asking some general questions and we'll see where the discussion goes. <coughs> all right, are we all settled up there? All right, what I'd like each panelist to do at first is just take about a minute, introduce yourself, uh, talk about what your expertise is, and if you can talk about what sustainability means to you, just so everyone in the audience knows where each of you are coming from. If we can start with uh, Dr. Nolan, and then we'll work our way all the way over to Mark Murphy. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Jessica Nolan. I'm a faculty member in the psychology department. Um, I think of myself as a conservation social scientist which basically means that I'm interested in using the tools and principles of psychology to understand and solve environmental problems and other social problems, but environmental problems as far as this panel tonight. Um, so my expertise essentially is in doing research, looking at environmental behavior, um, understanding why people do and don't engage in environmental behaviors, um, and figuring out how to uh, promote and encourage those behaviors. Um, and I have a variety of research um, along those lines, but i um, happy to say more if there's an interest. Oh, and as far as what sustainability means to me, um, I really like um, the idea of thinking about seventh generation, so making decisions today um, that give thought to what it will mean, <coughs> excuse me, um, to generations uh, down the road. My name is Michael Kahn. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm a professor of chemistry here at the University of Scranton. I actually teach organic chemistry, but uh, uh, my interests have broadened to include environmental chemistry and green chemistry or sustainable chemistry. 
and also bringing sustainability in general to the classroom. Uh, one of my passions is, is trying to get the word out there, so to speak, and um, one of the things I do here at the university is run a sustainability workshop for faculty, and um, we've been doing this since 2005, and we've had about 70 faculty through, through the sustainability workshop and integrate sustainability into their courses. But my area also of interest in my uh, is green chemistry or sustainable chemistry, and you say to yourself, well, what the heck is green chemistry? The bottom line is that, you know, if I mention the word chemical to most people, they go, ugh. They think of toxic waste dumps, right? They think of pollution. Right? They don't think about the wonderful things that are brought to you by the world of chemistry, like the drugs you take, like the chair you're sitting on, like the glasses, like the computers that you use. Every one of those things requires chemistry. And, uh, but us chemists have not paid enough attention to the environmental consequences of, in fact, of what we, what we do. So this is a huge movement amongst chemists at this point, and um, my passion is green chemistry education, and um, I've been involved in several books and give presentations, et cetera, et cetera. But green chemistry or sustainability in general mean to me my five grandchildren. There are 7.1 billion people on this planet, and I care about all 7.1 billion people. But the, my five grandchildren are what really brings it home to me, and really makes it personal. Because the bottom line is, I shudder to think what this planet is going to be like when they are 66 years old, what the age that I am in about 50 years or so from now, 60 years from now. So it's the next generation. It's, it's you, most of you young people out there, that you need to really think about this and how we are going to live more sustainably on this planet. Our ecological footprints exceeds the carrying capacity of this planet right now. And it's just getting larger and larger. And we have to figure out a way to live sustainably. It's on the top. Hello. There we go. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Senator John Blake. Um, I'm also, uh, as you heard earlier, an adjunct faculty here at the University of Scranton, and I'm delighted to be on this distinguished panel, and I appreciate the invitation to be part of this uh, important discussion tonight. I'm, um, I'm a senator which means I sit in a chamber of 50 people that represent 12.5 million citizens throughout the Commonwealth. I sit on an appropriations committee that presides over a nearly $30 billion budget every year of your family's tax dollars if you live in Pennsylvania. And um, I have, uh, up until about a month ago, uh, served on the board of an alternative energy company out of Rochester, New York, uh, which is another uh, hat that I've worn uh, over the past several years that has given me a glimpse of some of the things that you heard from Dr. Trincal tonight. Um, I, I basically, uh, as, a, as an economics teacher here, an inter introductory economics teacher, tell my students um, about what economics is about. It's about the allocation of scarce resources against unlimited human wants. And I think if you think about what the doctor said earlier about the United Nations back in the 1980s trying to come up with the definition of sustainability, you begin at the heart of it to understand that we're talking about scarce resources. And we're talking about whether the standard of living, as you already heard, from the panelists here um, is going to be improved or at least as good and, and, uh, as we've enjoyed, that the standard of living for the next generation uh, will be as good as that which we've enjoyed. So that's what it means for me. Uh, the decisions I make in Harrisburg on behalf of the people I represent here in northeastern Pennsylvania or on behalf of the entire state have to be driven by an understanding of scarce resources and making the appropriate decisions. The other thing you should know is that in addition to the allocation of resources is the regulatory nature of the state, the Department of Environmental Protection, the constitutional provisions that say we have an obligation as a commonwealth and our elected representatives have an obligation to ensure public safety, to ensure environmental stewardship, to ensure that the open space and the recreation opportunities and, um, and the agriculture uh, that we conduct, the largest industry in Pennsylvania, is done in a manner of sustainability. So that's what brings me to this panel. I'm delighted to be here and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. 
Thanks. Hi, I'm Sharon Marr. I'm a professor of philosophy, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Latin American Studies and Women's Studies, and I teach in all three of those programs. Um, I became, well, I've always been an interested in environmental issues. I grew up in a household where my father was uh, an environmentalist who spent a lot of time uh, as part of his community service just to the town where we lived studying wetlands and preserving wetlands. And uh, this was really, really before people were even talking very much about environmental issues. So I spent a lot of time going with him around to local people, talking about the, the importance of wetlands. So I've been interested in environmental issues since uh, for a very young age. But my background and interest is primarily in ethics and social and political theory. And I, I co-chair uh, the sustainability workshop that we do for faculty here at the University of Scranton. I see several of you in the room who have actually participated. And for those faculty who are here who have not, we really invite you to, um, to join us this May when we do our next workshop. Um, but I joined Mike in that pursuit because of my background really in what is the social dimension of sustainability, really talking about how we organize people, how we think about making social and political changes um, that can create a more sustainable world. Um, the more in which I've worked on this, though, the more it's become clear to me that we have to always keep the environment front and center. Because if we don't have a world that is healthy, if we don't have sufficient water, if we don't have sufficient energy, all the rest of the stuff doesn't really make very much difference um, at all. So for me, sustainability is, is about um, improving the quality of life. And I'm not so sure that that necessarily means we're going to be able to maintain the same standard of living. But I think it can be different, but perhaps better. But improving the quality of life in a way that does not uh, tax the carrying capacity of the earth, which is how we're maintaining our current standard of living right now. And that means um, really thinking differently about how we live and really organizing uh, ourselves differently. So for me, sustainability, that's, that's I think, the definition of sustainability, but I think sustainability is also a call to action, a call for us to each change how we live our lives individually, but even more importantly, um, really making demands from our government um, about um, what kinds of things we expect in terms of quality of life, and also becoming leaders, social change makers ourselves in our communities, and becoming technical and technological innovators like Nick and, and Jim. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jim Lovin. I've been with the university a long time. Uh, I just work as a lab equipment manager. Um, but years ago, we had a, a grant from the Sustainable Energy Fund to put in a solar installation off the Madison Avenue parking lot. And that got me interested in the solar technology. And what I find most interesting about solar technology is the ideal renewable energy resource. Because all the energy on Earth when you think about it, whether it's a fossil fuel or whatever, uh, any combustible energy really came from the sun. Maybe at first it was biomass, but in geological processes worked on it. But the sun is a almost infinite energy resource, and we need to uh, capitalize on that, if you will. It's, um, it's always going to be there until the end of our solar system. And um, I was happy to do this project. Um, but I'm kind of here tonight because I'm kind of interested in how my concept of sustainability can be expanded and how it relates uh, to other people's ideas of sustainability. Um, Nick presented our project. I thought it was a great presentation. And so I'll just turn you over to Mark here, who's our sustainability director for the physical plant. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, my name is Mark Murphy. I'm an electrical engineer. I've been working at the university for well over 20 years. Uh, the first 20 years or 22 years, I was the university's engineer. And as the university's engineer, I got involved with a lot of projects. 
And uh, I was also given the uh, responsibility of paying the four and a half million dollars of utility bills that the school incurs every year. Uh, just this past year, uh, if I was looking at our budgets for our utilities, we're only at about three and a half million dollars. So in a 20 year period, instead of paying four and a half million dollars for electric, gas, water, sewer, uh, what we're paying is about three and a half million dollars. And um, if I were sitting where you're sitting right now, I would be thinking, he must have his numbers reversed. It should be three and a half million 20 years ago and four and a half millions now. And it's, that's not the case. We've reduced our, our, our energy costs by about a million dollars in about 20 years, even though we've built many new buildings that have uh, a lot of regulations that inc include increased ventilation and uh, increased energy usage. And the place that we're able to save this energy is through adding technology. Uh, solar, sure, it's a great technology. We have a solar project up on the Madison Avenue parking lot. It's a technology that, you know, in the future, uh, we'll find many uses. Uh, but there's other areas where we can do things where we can save, whether it's electricity, natural gas, or water. Um, back about seven years ago, we did a project on campus that saved uh, 10 million gallons of water a year. And the neat thing about that project is it didn't just save it in the first year, it saves it every year after that. So the university has been very aggressive at, uh, at reinvesting in itself. When we build a new building, we build green buildings. When we build new buildings, we've been also building buildings that are considered lead buildings, leadership in environmental and energy design. Uh, the Naples Center building we're in right now is a lead silver building. The Loyola Science Center will most likely end up being, become a Leeds gold building once all the certification paperwork is done. Uh, the new rehab center will be designed as a Leeds building. Uh, but the neat thing is all this technology that gets used and applied, you're able to reduce and reduce and reduce your energy or your water usage. Uh, I always like to tell the story about the Long Center lighting and the, the Long Center gymnasium are where we do our competitive basketball. Um, probably 10 years ago, I replaced all the lights in there, used about half the number of light fixtures, reduced the energy usage down to about 40% of where it was at. I really liked that project, okay? It was a great, a great look. Everything was wonderful in that place. Well, about five years ago, I redid the lights in the room again because I was able to reduce the energy in half again. And again, there's technology out there today, um, LED lights, which are using a quarter of the light that our new technology is using. Um, over the Columbus Day weekend when we were on break, I had an electrical contractor install LED light fixtures in the Madison Avenue parking lot. It reduced the energy usage down to a quarter of what it was the day before. And the neat thing about that parking lot, its energy is applied from a solar project. So I was able to go to a, a, gra a, a metering system from PP&L to see exactly what the energy usage happened after the lights were replaced. And it was neat. I showed that on one of the days, we generated more electricity than we used. So sometimes the neat thing is to find ways to make your solar energy create more energy. But on the other side, what you can do is do things to not use the energy. And the philosophy that I was given from the, uh, uh, of all places, the Environmental Protection Agency, was that if you don't use the electricity, the electric company didn't have to make the electricity. And if the electric company didn't make the electricity, they didn't have to usually burn coal to make the electricity. So that means if you don't use electricity, you're reducing pollution generation. And that's a key part of it. Um, as far as my definition for sustainability, uh, I think I'm a little more aggressive than most people. Is uh, I don't look at it that the uh, kind of the old Boy Scout quote that uh, when you head into the woods and you leave the woods, you should leave the woods the same way you found them. I think we're at the point in our history where, um, due to what we've done and our ancestors have done over the last 100 years, is that we've used too much of our resources. We've polluted too much. We created too much waste. And I hate to say it, now it's our responsibility not to leave the woods the way we found it, is that we need to leave it better. We need to do more. We need to be more aggressive. So, thank you. All right, thank you for those introductions. I think everyone, uh, some t sometime during their introductions, talked about standards of living. Uh, I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Nolan, but then anyone feel free to chime in after she answers. Um, how do you convince people? Because I think a lot of people in this room want to do something to help sustainability. How do you convince people to take action? And uh, through that action, should we focus on changing policy or individual behaviors? 
Um, so of course, I'm a good academic, so my answer is gonna basically be, um, we have to do both, um, right? It's a false dichotomy to think that we should either choose between encouraging individual changes in behavior like turning off the lights and using less water when you brush your teeth and things like that. Um, those are certainly things that we can and should be doing. Um, but I think, um, as Sharon alluded to in her introduction, um, the level of change that's required, um, and also as Mark just alluded to, um, the level of change that's required to have a sustainable future um, is gonna go beyond those small scale, scale behaviors. Um, but I would argue that political change is still an individual level behavior in that individuals have to demand that our political leaders um, make that change that we wanna see. So um, I know that we have a, a kind of sort of bad reputation um, for not necessarily being terribly political on our campus. Um, and I would argue that at least in the realm of sustainability, um, that that would be um, an issue to take a stand on um, when and if you can. Um, with respect to how to promote environmental behaviors, I would say um, the best start that you can make is to be an example. Um, the one thing we know about promoting any behavior is that hypocrisy does not work. Um, the do as I say, not as I do approach, whether it be in parenting um, or any other domain, um, it just doesn't work. So if you want to be a proponent of the environment, um, you have to become a model um, of environmental citizenship. So, um, you know, be the change you wish to see, wish to see I guess, um, would be a starting point. I mean, there's lots of other, you know, subtle strategies that one can use to convince others um, to make changes. Um, but I won't go into those details, which are probably not quite as interesting. I guess I'll ask Senator Blake to follow up on what is the state doing to uh, uh, doing to support the influence on enhancing sustainability practices? Well, actually, that relates to your first question, right? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it is citizens that hold their elected leadership responsible. Um, if if Markets are booming 24 hours a day, 365, everybody's employed, GDP is going up at 10% per year. I'm not sure whether that's a measure of the health of our society. Uh, if it exploits resources to the point where we erode the quality of life going forward. So then the point that Dr. Nolan made is about holding elected leaders responsible. And to your, to your point, Doctor, the issue is, you know, does, it, does everybody recycle here? How about a show of hands? Who recycles? Okay, so. There was a time when there was no such thing as a recycling policy in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. It wasn't even a matter of public policy until people started realizing maybe this is something we ought to be concerned about. And I don't want to take up too much time, but in, in 1988, we passed the Municipal Waste Planning, Recycling, and Waste Reduction Act. It was Act 101. It affected, uh, there's more than 11.6 million residents, about 94% of the state's population with access to recycling programs now in your own community. Uh, in 2011, the most recent data reported Pennsylvania recycled over 5.85 million tons of resources. The materials we recycled saved about 168 million BTUs, British thermal units of energy and cost, cut more than 15 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions from the air. So what's the state doing? It's, it's hopefully listening to its citizens and articulating policies and leading to programs and deploying your state resources in a manner that incents business to do the right thing by the people. Um, we've also done something very quickly, I'll just mention, called an alternative energy portfolio standard, which told our electric utilities that perhaps between now and the year 2021, that they should try to generate electricity in this state from alternative energy sources, other than coal or natural gas or fossil fuels. So we've seen a migration toward hydro, toward solar, toward, toward wind, uh, in the hopes that we can see electric generation coming from alternative sources. So. That's, that's what, this, and I can go through a lot of programs. I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, try to deal with those later. Well, it sounds like we, there's a lot of things going on in the state, and I was hoping, Dr. Marr, could you talk about some of the things we're doing on campus to educate students and maybe let them know about what's going on now that maybe they can get involved in? Sure, well, uh, I think others can speak to this too. I don't know if, 
Are, is this working? I, okay, I have to just really lean in. Um, I mentioned before that we offer these faculty workshops and that might, might not seem like it impacts students, but that's of course what it's all about. So we've been doing, as um, Dr. Kahn said, since 2005, we've been running faculty workshops. And those workshops are about teaching faculty how to infuse sustainability into the curriculum. And um, we have worked with 70 different faculty who have infused sustainability into all different disciplines across the university. And uh, so that's certainly the first start, is working with the faculty to make faculty aware, thinking about all the different ways in which um, we can and need to address sustainability. Because as Dean Kniff said in his introduction, uh, sustainability is not a problem that can be addressed or solved by a single discipline. It really requires all of us working together and thinking together. There are so many different facets of uh, sustainability. So we're infusing sustainability into a tremendous amount of courses because 70 faculty um, who teach many different courses, some of them have infused sustainability into all of their courses. It really um, has had a, a, a big change, I think, in the curriculum. Um, without us changing all the courses. We've added some new courses, and I think that's been important. Um, Dr. Nolan and several of, of others of us are also working to um, revitalize and strengthen the environmental um, studies concentration, which is open to all majors and all colleges. Dr. Kahn uh, runs, uh, directs, or co-directs the environmental studies major. So we offer a lot of things formally um, through the curriculum. Uh, but we're also trying to do more extracurricular events, like the, and this is a really good example. And um, Mark Murphy actually can talk more about some of the things, like the, maybe you should talk about the club. Mm -hmm. uh, this past summer, well, in Ju June 1st, I was, uh, my new position is that I'm now the, in charge of the Office of Sustainability on the University of Scranton's campus, which we didn't have an Office of Sustainability before. Uh, and I am the Director of Sustainability. Uh, that doesn't mean that the University of Scranton has not been having a large number of efforts that have to do with sustainability or being environmentally conscious on campus. Uh, the key th of the problem was is people were doing it all over the place and part of my job is gonna be to corral all these efforts along with focusing some of our efforts and energies into areas that may be more uh, uh, will be better at making the University of Scranton, not just the University of Scranton sustainable, but as we've been talking about the faculty workshop, uh, I'm from the, what we would call the facility side of the university. We, make, we build the place, we build the buildings, we make the place run, we keep the lights on, keep the heat and air conditioning going, light the streets, uh, pay the bills. Um, but the most important part of what we do at the University of Scranton, our business is education. That is the most important thing that we do. And when we talk about how can we promote change within not just our country, but in the world, it's from our students that are sitting out here right now listening, okay, is getting the message out to our students. It's in our education is where we can make change. Uh, at the University of Scranton, sure, I've done a whole bunch of things that save a lot of money, save a lot of energy, save lots of millions of gallons of water, okay, however, if just one of the students at the university last year that graduated goes and works at a state university which is 20 times larger than we are and has a job similar to mine and happened to pick up some sustainable practices from here and decides it's very important at the place that they go and they enact these sort of things, they're doing it at a place 20 times bigger than we are. And that's just talking about one student. The neat thing is every year we graduate over 900 students. And within those 900 students, if we can get them to think about when they go to work someplace that, oh, why don't we have a recycling program here? Why aren't we doing that? Why are we using so much bottled water on this business? Okay, things like that. Why don't we have motion sensors on our lights here? Okay, it's good business. That's the other neat thing is that in our School of Management and on a good number of courses, they're teaching a thing called the triple bottom line. And part of it, it brings in the environment, the planet, and the people. Okay, but the finances they bring in also. And a lot of times in business, if it has to do with money, okay, but it also has to do with saving energy and the environment, okay, usually it ends up being a good business decision to be green. So, 
um, again, the main thing we do is education. And uh, even though and what I'm doing and have done in the past is I try to have a lot of good examples on campus, run a good type ship, a good, have, run, have good business practices. But the main thing that we do on this campus to affect the world uh, has to do with our education. And uh, it goes back to our mission for justice, which is our Catholic and Jesuit identity of our school, is that it's very simple. What we need to do is take care of God's planet, God's creation. And that's, where, you know, that's why we need to do these things. Jim, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Uh, Jim, Jim and I go on coffee breaks almost, I don't know, probably six or seven times a day. So we talk about a lot of, oh, wait, sorry. Jim, I say that but Jim, I was, hoping, I, I was hoping you can just talk a little bit about, um, you, well, you did mention why you're getting involved in this project, but, you know, why should people care about renewable energy? Why is it important that you're, we're doing this project? What, what's the end, uh, end game here? Well, uh, except for nuclear, most of the energy we use comes from fossil fuels. That includes uh, wood, carbon-based fuels, oil, natural gas. There's an environmental impact from burning them. But more than that, as somebody uh, observed, uh, the economist, I believe, uh, they're actually scarce resources. The rest of the world, they want to be like us. And if they were like us, it, it would, it's not possible. So strategically, I'm hoping that the, I don't know how to express it, the less developed world, the world that is still developing, uses uh, sustainable technologies such as solar and wind as they build their infrastructure. This would be better for everyone. Eventually, we're going to have to redesign our infrastructure also to depend heavily on renewable resources. Uh, might as well start right now. You know, it's what we're doing. It's what we're doing. Uh, Dr. Ken, I'm hoping uh, you can give us some examples of green chemistry, because I know when people hear chemistry, I don't know how many people actually want to talk about it, but <laughs> will you give us some examples about how it would apply to the students in this, in this uh, room? Oh, everybody loves chemistry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the way, organic chemistry, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m., baby. <laughs> if you, if you want to join us, come. We have a great time. Uh, uh, by the way, I have to put a plug in, too, for next semester. I teach in a course called Chem 100. It's chemistry for um, non-science majors. And frankly, it's, uh, the course is, deals with a great deal with green chemistry and sustainability. Um, so if you're interested in this sort of stuff, we can have some fun next semester uh, for non-science majors. But uh, yeah, what types of things are green chemistry? It's all over the ballpark. Um, if you think about pesticides, you know, one of the things we do with pesticides, we spray pesticides and, you know, we want to kill a certain insect. The bottom line is most pesticides are broad spectrum pesticides. Kills not only the insect you want to kill, but kills beneficial insects. So what chemists are working on is our, our pesticides that focus on a particular organism so that we don't kill the, the good, the bad. You know, we want to kill the, the, the bad and the ugly, so to speak, but not the good, so to speak. But other things we're doing, um, producing energy from biomass, particularly liquid fuels. If you take a look, we can, we can now take uh, things like cellulose and frankly not convert it to ethanol. Well, cellulosic ethanol is just wonderful, but uh, the ethanol that we burn in our gas tanks comes from the kernels of corn, and that is the biggest boondoggle on the planet, in my opinion. But the bottom line is we're producing cellulosic ethanol now. We're also producing uh, really gasoline. We can make gasoline from renewable materials, from biomass. What else do we do? You see this plastic bottle? It's got my brother's name on the bottom of it. Anybody know my brother's name? Pete, yeah, it's Pete. Yeah, my brother's name is Pete. I haven't found a bottle yet that has Mike on the bottom of it. If you find one, please let me know. But the bottom line is this, this, this plastic bottle came from petroleum, right? A non-renewable resource, right? If you go to, well, I can show you some plastics that are made from biomass. 
It's another thing that chemists are doing is now producing chemicals, uh, polymers from biomass, right? The other thing we're doing now is taking cellulose. Cellulose is the biggest, uh, is the most abundant polymer on the planet. But the bottom line is cellulose is very, very difficult to, uh, uh, to dissolve in anything, to make fibers and, and films out of. But now we can do it, thanks to something called ionic liquids. Uh, so it, it runs the gamut from fuels to, and new drugs too, uh, new syntheses for drugs. Come on by, I'll show you a new synthesis for ibuprofen, and all you have to do is be able to distinguish between green and brown. And you'll be able to notice that what a brand new synthesis of ibuprofen looks like that creates much less waste. So these are some of the types of things, but um, I could go on and on and on, of course. <laughs> well, I know some people in the audience have to get to some other events, so I'm going to ask one last question. But if you do have specific questions you'd like to ask the panelists, I'll ask them to stick around afterwards and we can have smaller groups. But I guess we'll start with Mark and then work our way back over to Jessica. If you wanted to leave them with one thing tonight, what would that be in terms of sustainability? What could they take home with them? I think the one thing that can empower just about anyone, the, the thing that I think can empower just about anyone, something that you can take away from this room right now, is to be an example of sustainable practices is I have this habit in my office that I have I use a lot of post-its uh, it helps me remember things helps me not forget things um, but on a case like I have a trash can in my office and I'll finish a post-it I'll have done the done the task or whatever and wrinkle that little thing up and I just can't throw it in the trash can in my office so I've got to walk down you know when I head down the hallway where our recycling containers, and I take it down there. Um, but it's just, if you can look at it, it's all the way down to the little tiny post-it, okay, is put it in a recycling container. Plastic bottles and cans, put it in a recycling container. If we can reduce our, our, our landfill waste, recycle materials, don't waste energy, don't waste water. Water is the most valuable resource that our planet has. Uh, so if you can ever do something to, to reduce water consumption, do that. Uh, we were at a uh, Pennsylvania Environmental Council Awards dinner uh, middle of last week, and the keynote speaker was a woman from Procter & Gamble. And at Procter & Gamble, they mainly do a good job about making products, but they also make a lot of money. They have one department, only one department out of that whole worldwide corporation that's nonprofit. And with that, that woman is the woman who's in charge of that department. And what they do is they make little packets of a chemical that's used to put into very dirty water to make it clean water that's safe for people to drink. Okay. And they distribute this all over the world, especially to Central America, Africa. Uh, it's water. And that's how important water is, is that you know, it was amazing to see them actually do this as a demonstration while the chemo speaker spoke. It was, it was incredible. Um, but as I said, be an example. That's the best thing I could say is be an example. Um, I could only suggest that you always be aware of the needs of others and uh, the needs of all. Um, that's all I really have to suggest. It's a little vague, I'm sorry. but. <laughs> We're educating you to be leaders, and that means being a leader in your workplace and a leader in your community. You be the change. And it does begin with becoming mindful of our own habits and our own lifestyles, but it can't end there. It has to mean that we also engage in, in change, that we become part of the solution. And I guess I want to add one other thing. I, I, I actually work a lot in so-called developing nations. I've worked both in sub-Saharan Africa and various places in Latin America. And the impact of our unsustainable lifestyles are affecting peoples in the, what they call the global south, south of the equator, now, right? It's not, it's not when you're 66, it's not your children. It's happening now. And that's one of the reasons why I would say it's such an important social justice issue. 
Thanks, Doctor. I, um, I would only echo the sentiments of the other panelists. I, would, I used to have a consultant that I worked with in my early days uh, in public life, and he had a uh, motto. It was on his letterhead, think globally, act locally. Um, I think that kind of captures what you've already heard. But I would, I would add to that, nothing is free. Nothing is free. Um, the clean water that you drink, there, had a, there, was, there was something that had to be done in order to make that possible. The air that you breathe that's clean, there's a reason. It's not by accident and it's not free. Um, and I would say one last thing, hold people like me accountable and hold people in your community accountable. Um, if you see something that doesn't seem right, um, that could compromise your health, your public safety, you know, you have to not be passive. You, and you have to talk to people like me and your elected officials and you have to raise your voice. Um, it's the only way change gets affected in our institutional arrangements and, and through uh, representative government. So the last message I'd leave to you is hold people like me accountable. I would like to um, encourage you certainly to think about um, sustainability in your personal life, but as Dr. Mara suggested, uh, it, you folks, the, the students here are going to you know, graduate in a year or two or three or four, five, well, whatever, <laughs> you know. But the, the bottom line is think about what you want to be when you grow up, so to speak. What is your profession going to be? And how can you contribute to sustainability with your profession? If you're a communications major, you can get the word out for us. How are we going to communicate this to the rest of the world? If you're an economics major, whoa, sustainable economics. How the heck can we go move to sustainable economies, for crying out loud? You know, if you're an accounting major, for crying out loud, how about full cost accounting? Not just pricing, say, a good based upon what it costs to produce it, but also the environmental cost, perhaps of using it, producing it, disposing of it, you know, you name it. If you're a psych major, yeah, how do you get people thinking about, how do you change their behavior, right? What else do we have out there? You know, if you're, no, no matter what your major is, any education majors out there, you can make a world of difference, right? is you're going to be educating our future generations, right? So think about how your profession can contribute to sustainability and how you can affect the planet. And the bottom line is, you know, we need to be innovative. You know, the United States is one of the most innovative countries on the planet. And we've grown our economy on innovation. Now we really have to think about innovation in terms of sustainability. And by the way, you can make a buck at it. So think about it from that perspective. So you make a better mousetrap, a more efficient mousetrap, people are going to beat a path to your door, just like Professor Chung Kaley and Mr. Lovins, uh, new solar panel. Wow, fantastic, right? So think about how you in your profession can make a big difference. I guess the message I'd like to leave you with is the idea, kind of similar to what Dr. Mars said, that the future is now, um, and I actually want to explain what I'm wearing tonight. I know I look different than the other panelists, and it's on purpose. Um, I'm not just underdressed. Um, I actually have on my uh, very first Earth Day t-shirt. Um, it's from 1991 at the Bronx High School of Science. This is the year that you were probably born. <laughs> Don't let 22 years go by and let these problems that I started thinking about at my first Earth Day in 1991 be problems that you're going to need to be talking about and begging desperately for the current students to address. The future is now. And we're with you. You know, we older generation people, you know, we're still here. We still want to work on the issues. You know, we're not saying they're your problems now, but um, we've all inherited these problems. Um, so let's. Let's try to solve them and make it so that the next generation doesn't have to deal with them. All right, let's just thank the panelists for answering the question.
All right, so that concludes the symposium. But if you'd like to stick around and ask any of us specific questions, I know Jim and I will be out there uh, hucking the solar project. So if you want to talk to us, we'll be out there. If not, have a great night. Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks. Hey, Michael.